So as many of you know, Bernie Sanders just had another town hall with Fox News, and this really couldn't have come at a better time, because when he is on Fox News, I think he's at his best, right? He performs really well under pressure, knowing that they're going to be extra biased against him, and every question will have this right word tilt. He knows that he has to come prepared, and that he did. And really watching this town hall, it, it shows that, like, he really is unique. He really is special. And we were lucky enough to have a second opportunity to elect Bernie Sanders, to make this person this once-in-a-lifetime candidate president. And if we pass up this opportunity twice in a row, then I can't imagine any scenario in the United States where we are able to get real change because you have this opportunity and people are just so fearful of what could happen or what you know would happen if we run someone who's too far left because the media propaganda it's just it's so overwhelming that it makes voters doubt themselves even but with that being said this town hall was great. I'm going to link to it in the description box so you can watch the full thing, but I do have a couple of clips, and I, I think that these clips show why Bernie Sanders is such a phenomenal candidate. So when it comes to coronavirus, for example, he is saying something that nobody else in media is saying, and it's so important, which is why it makes the United States like uniquely unprepared to deal with coronavirus, not because we have Donald Trump as president, but because of our political system and what we offer to working class Americans. We will talk, I am sure, about Medicare for all. Yes, but when I talk about health care being a human right and all people having health care, the coronavirus crisis makes that abundantly clear as to why it should be. You got millions of people in this country today who may feel that they have a symptom. But you know what? They cannot afford to go to a doctor. And then they're going to go to work. We have a president of the United States, you know, doesn't matter, go to work. We have a president who says absurd things. So what we need to do is right now make it clear that all Americans, if you are feeling sick, go to a doctor. It will be paid for. Don't hesitate to go to the doctor. <laughs> I'll give you another example. As all of you know, or should know, we are the only major country on earth that does not have paid family and medical leave. So what does that mean in practical terms? When half of the people in this country are living paycheck to paycheck, today you're feeling sick, maybe you're coughing, maybe you have a fever, but you know what, you gotta get to work. You gotta go to your job in McDonald's or Burger King or Walmart because you don't go to work, you don't get a paycheck, you don't get a paycheck, you don't feed your family. What happens if you have that virus and you're going to work? You're spreading it to other people. So right now, while we move to make paid family and medical leave national policy, at this moment at least, we say to every worker, if you are sick, stay home, and we will figure out a way to make sure that you are compensated and get your salary so your family doesn't suffer. And this should be said every single time coronavirus is talked about, because look, when it comes to these types of, you know, um, pandemics and whatnot, we're not prepared to deal with it because Americans don't have a choice. They can't just choose to stay home if they have symptoms. They can't just choose to go see a doctor. Like the situation that we are in currently, the situation that working class people are in specifically makes them incapable of dealing with this appropriately. So you can have all these protocols. You can suggest that they stay home if they're feeling sick. But we have an economic system that makes that impossible currently. So in the event we have these types of highly contagious things spread like coronavirus or the flu and whatnot, it's going to be worse in systems where one, we don't have universal health care. And two, where we're not allowed to take time off of work because if we do, then we can't feed ourselves. So Bernie Sanders is the only person who's talking about it that way. And on the subject of Medicare for All and why it's so important as it relates to coronavirus, he explained how the benefits for Medicare for All they're obvious. I mean, yes, we need a payroll tax to fund Medicare for All, but when we eliminate copays, premiums, deductibles, the average person is going to save more money. Now, the Fox host here tried to follow up with a hacky point and was booed, but towards the end of this clip, you're going to see that he got her conceding to some of his points and agreeing with him. If right now you're the average worker, okay, you're paying $12,000 a year for health care. And if I said to that worker that I can provide better health care for substantially less, but you'll have to pay more in taxes, I admit it, okay? 
So let's say you pay $1,200, $2,000 more in taxes for comprehensive health care, but you're not paying $12,000 in premiums, co-payments, and out-of-pocket expenses. Who has the better deal? Well, that may be true for the $12,000 a year person. For the thirty or $40,000 a year per person who likes the health plan they have from their, from their employer, there's a hundred, hold on, there's 180 million Americans who have coverage that they like, but you're going to take that away from them. No, we're going to, no. First of all, no. it's 150 million, and this is what we're doing. Every year, do you know how many people lose their health insurance every year? Because they lose their job or they transfer or whatever may happen, they quit. Definitely. About 50 million people a year lose their health insurance. That's true, okay? What we are doing is what every other country on earth does. Why do you think, why do you think it's a great, I'm pointing, I don't mean to be, I don't mean to be yeah. argumentative, I really, I'm looking at you, you know, I don't know, I mean, it could be many of my democratic opponents, the same thing. Sure. All right, why do you think that it's a wonderful idea that employers in this country are burdened with the cost of health care? Why is well, it they, that They would probably agree with you, they'd probably not want to have that burden. That's but right. it has covered a lot of people in the but, country. Yeah. Look, you're a small business person. You're a decent person. You've got 10 people working for you, right? You want to provide health care. It is enormously expensive. It is. All right? Absolutely, that's true. So every other country has said, you know what? You're a small business man. Do your damn business. Don't worry about health care. We will yeah. cover all health care for you as a human right. So, so I think, and I just want to end on this note. And the coronavirus makes this point. We lose, and thir we lose conservatively, guys, about 30,000 people every year. That's conservative who die because they don't get to a doctor when they should. That's a tragedy. But you can see the absurdity of the current system today when people cannot afford to go to the doctor who may be struggling with the coronavirus. I don't know how you can anybody can defend the system where we're spending twice as much per person, and yet you've got 87 million uninsured or underinsured. It is an indefensible system unless we worry about the healthcare industry, which made $100 billion in profits last year. Senator, we gave One thing that we have to acknowledge is that we've won this battle. We have won the messaging war, and the Democratic Party, by and large, is with Bernie Sanders here. But they're not necessarily voting for Bernie Sanders, even if they're with him on the policy, because they're too afraid. They think that Bernie Sanders is too radical, too extreme, and that's largely because of what they've been told, not just by the media, but by the Democratic Party establishment. They've been pushing this, that you need a moderate, and saying, you know, we can't run someone like Bernie because look at what happened in 1972. No, look at what happened in 2004 with John Kerry in 2016 with Hillary Clinton. Don't look to 1972 with George McGovern. Look to the recent history. Moderate Democrats lose. And to even suggest that Bernie Sanders is is radical it really is i think it's a disservice to americans because what he is proposing these are mainstream populist ideas and he made this point at the town hall and i think it's something that he needs to say over and over again um i reject the idea i really do that's one of the things that bothers me you know i hear it every day i hear it on the media i hear it from my opponents bernie is an extremist bernie is too radical okay let's deal with it is raising a starvation minimum wage of $7.25 an hour, which has not been raised in 10 years, to $15 an hour, a living wage, a radical idea? No. Is making public colleges and universities tuition free so that all of our people have the opportunity to get a higher education in a competitive global economy, is that a radical idea? No is doing what every other major country on earth does, guaranteeing health care to all as a right. I live 50 miles away from the Canadian border. This is not a communist society up there in Montreal. <laughs> they guarantee health care to all. They spend 50% of what we spend. Is passing a Medicare for all single-payer system a radical idea? No! And last point, Donald Trump, I know he's on the network a whole lot, Donald, you're probably watching. How are you? <laughs> All right. I know. Wanted to say hello to the president. He's he thinks, giving a news conference. Oh, isn't he? I'm sure he's watching Fox on the side there. You know, he's <laughs> kind of addicted to your station. Uh, Trump thinks that climate change is a hoax. And that's because he doesn't understand or respect science. I believe that, sci that climate change is an existential threat to this planet. I will listen to the scientists who tell us that we have got to move aggressively 
to transform our energy system away from fossil fuel to energy efficiency and sustainable energy. And through a Green New Deal, by the way, we can create up to 20 million good paying jobs. So my point is, I reject, I appreciate Allison raising the question. I just don't think any of those ideas are radical. That is what he should be saying, but I think that he needs to sharpen his message. So don't just say that your ideas aren't radical because you're correct there. And he said this at a town hall at CNN recently, and it's it's something he should hammer away at. But you also have to explain how not only are your ideas not radical, but Joe Biden is the one who's actually out of lockstep with the Democratic Party and Americans, because it doesn't really matter if you are a Republican or a Democrat. You know, voters, they aren't as ideological and partisan as people in D.C. So when you look at public opinion polls, they support Medicare for all. They support legalizing marijuana and raising the minimum wage. So if you're against most of those things, then you are the one who's truly out of step, therefore you are radical. And Kyle Kalinske made this point about strategy and how, you know, uh, Bernie needs to hammer away how Joe Biden is actually the one that's extreme. And I think that that is a strategy that Bernie has to implement going forward. It's not too late, but he's got to really try to normalize his policy positions and not allow the mainstream media to monopolize discourse when it comes to issues like Medicare for all or legalizing marijuana, because these aren't radical ideas. If every other country in the world has them, then it's not radical. But shifting gears, the uh, subject of Hillary Clinton uh, came up and his response was great because it showed that, you know, he's not like these other rehearsed focus group driven politicians. He has this set of talking points, but he knows how to turn on the charm. He can just be personable and relatable. And his response to Hillary Clinton's attacks, I thought were just fantastic. Bernie just drove me crazy. He was in Congress for years, years. He had one senator support him. Nobody likes him. Nobody wants to work with him. He got nothing done. He was a career politician. He, had, he did not work till he was like 41 and then he got elected to something. It was all just baloney. And I feel so bad that, you know, people got sucked into it. Wow, that's strong stuff. What's your reaction? Unlike Secretary Clinton, I don't want to relive 2016. We're in 2020. <laughs> but what I would say, on a good day, my wife likes me. <laughs> but also, if you guys look at some of the polling that they do for United States senators, you know, they do polls how popular you are. In most cases, I turn out to be the most popular United States senator in the whole country. So one or two people most likely. That was great. He said the same thing already when this was brought up before, but you do have to be personable. You do have to show people that you're a human being. And I think it's important that he brags that he is the most popular politician in America. He has the highest favorability out of everyone in the Senate. So even though, you know, he's a humble individual, he's a nice guy and he doesn't want to brag about that, this is an election. You've got to brag. You've got to, you know, make sure that people know you're the best person to take on Donald Trump. You've got to be confident. And I think he's getting better. He's gotten better at, that, at, at this, certainly since 2016. But he's got to turn that up. And I think that bragging about what he's been able to accomplish is important. And he does do that in a, a specific portion where he talks about how he's not ineffective. He is actually effective. And he took some time to actually boast about his record because his record is great. Like he hasn't just had good votes. He's actually managed to reach across the aisle and get things accomplished to where he's not compromising on his core beliefs. He's getting them to meet him in an area where they agree and he's not compromising. Uh, this was a really important clip. I, I should tell you, I know that there's another mythology going out around me that everybody hates me. We heard that from Secretary Clinton that I can't work for with anybody. Check the record and you'll find that in the 1990s when I was in the House, I passed more roll call amendments on the floor of the House, bipartisan, than any other member of the House, year after year after year. So in other words, when we see people who have common interests, I don't care what party they're in, for example, uh, there were and have been and are today a number of Republicans who are outraged that we are spending 10 times more uh, for prescription drugs, same prescription drugs than people in other countries. They were getting ripped off day and night by the collusion uh, and price fixing in the pharmaceutical industry. There are Republicans who want to address that. I will work with them on that issue. 
There are Republicans who know that our infrastructure, roads, bridges, water systems are collapsing. I will certainly work with them on that. I worked with uh, Mike Lee, you know, Mike Lee of Utah. Mike and I was a very conservative Republican from Utah. Mike and I worked together to uh, pass for the first time under the War Powers Act uh, a Senate resolution getting the United States out of the horrific war in Yemen. All right. Mike Lee, a conservative Republican, and I worked together on that. I worked with the late John McCain, who was a friend of mine. We had different points of view, but I respected John immensely. Uh, John and I worked together when I was chairman of the U.S. Senate Committee on Veterans Affairs on perhaps the most comprehensive veterans bill passed in modern history. So the idea that I cannot work with Republicans on issues where we can come together is just not accurate. Right. So that was important. And what Bernie Sanders has got to do is hammer away on the fact that he's the most effective person running for president. He was able to work with a Tea Party Republican, Mike Lee, to pass a resolution under the War Powers Act to stop giving weapons to Saudi Arabia. Who else in the Democratic Party can say that they were able to accomplish this, right? Nobody else can. Bernie Sanders has got to start saying, I'm effective, Joe Biden is not effective. Joe Biden cannot get things done because he's out of touch with his own party. I can get things done. Joe Biden cannot get things done. Now, on the subject of Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders hammering him, I talked about in a different segment that Bernie Sanders has got to play hardball. He can't be nice. He's got to actually hit Joe Biden and hit him hard. Now, he was asked about Joe Biden's presumable cognitive decline, and the answer here was incredibly weak. So, you know, this wasn't a perfect town hall, but uh, I want to play this clip because there's an area for opportunity here that Bernie needs to capitalize on. Some of Joe Biden's answers don't make sense. Do you think it's acceptable for a presidential candidate to respond to questions like Joe Biden does? Well, let me just... Let me just say this. Um, you know, Joe Biden is a friend of mine. I've known him for... a many, many years. When we do our events and our rally, rallies, we try to give, we respect people in a sense, and we give really substantive, these guys will think maybe too long-winded answers, but we take people, there are real crises facing this country. When I give a speech, often it's 45 minutes or an hour, okay? Because there are a lot of challenges that the country faces, and I gotta talk about them. You know, I think Joe was somewhere in, uh, where was he, I don't know, Michigan or, or someplace else the other day? And he spoke for seven minutes. I don't know how you say anything other than, you know, minimal discussion in seven minutes. So all that I have always believed is that if we believe in democracy, a candidate has got to be honest with the people about what he or she believes, given the many, many challenges facing our country. And when you do that, when you're honest and you look at the hard issues, so you're going to take on the fossil fuel industry or Wall Street, or the drug companies, it brings forth opposition. I know that. I get beaten up every day. That's fine. That's what I do. But all I would say is, I'm not going to criticize Joe, but to say that I think the American people in this incredibly complicated and difficult moment in our history are entitled to thoughtful answers to the crises we face. He's almost programmed to where whenever Joe Biden's name comes up, he says, Joe Biden is a friend of mine. You have to stop, Bernie. You have to stop saying this. It's getting on my nerves. That's that's one thing. But on top of it, like, you don't have to preface every criticism of Joe Biden with this qualification that, oh, he's a great person. You know, he's he's one of my best friends ever. Nobody cares. This is an election. Joe Biden is not a good person, okay? He is running to get elected and do nothing. And that's if he's lucky enough to beat Trump. Don't think he's going to be able to do that. But Bernie... You know, he kind of alluded, like he tap danced around this, but he alluded to the fact that maybe Joe Biden's team is trying to hide him away from the public. So he referenced Joe Biden's seven minute speech, but he referenced it and then ran away from it. But what do you mean? Like, why did you bring up the seven minute speech that Joe Biden just made? Like, why is that important? You have to connect the dots for voters because voters aren't going to do that themselves. So you have to be the person that connects it for them. Say it. Just say what you're thinking. Joe Biden's team is hiding him away from the public because they believe that he is a detriment to himself if they hear him speak. Because he does stumble over his own words, and we're not talking about a stutter. We are talking about cognitive decline that we can all see. 
I mean, it happens to people when you get older. I'm not diagnosing him with anything. I'm saying that he does not, he's not as sharp as he used to be. That's obvious. That's not a conspiracy theory to say this. And regardless of how loud the media screeches about this, I mean, Trump's going to bring it up. We have to grapple with this. You can't hide away uh, from the public forever. So for Bernie Sanders to reference that seven-minute speech and then run away from it, what a missed opportunity. Now, later on, one of the hosts actually brought it up again, asking him, what do you mean by this? And Bernie basically said, well, look, there's so much policies to talk about. Why, you know, how could I possibly say it all in seven minutes? Tie it together, Bernie. Tie it all together. Make it very clear that Joe Biden... And his team's strategy is to hide him away from the public and that in a general election between him and Trump, you can't hide. If you hide, you will lose. Trump will capitalize on that. Call him out for hiding. Now, after this, he was shown clips of Julian Castro, Cory Booker, and Joe Scarborough of Morning Joe making the very obvious point that, you know, Joe Biden is very much in cognitive decline. I don't know what's going on there. But what we do know is that put him on a stage against Donald Trump, he will get crushed. He will get crushed because he struggles to articulate himself. You can see it's very difficult for him to collect his thoughts. And I totally sympathize with the stutter, right? That's something that we can all give him a pass for. But we're not just talking about a simple stutter. So, you know, this was brought up. They tried to really get Bernie Sanders to answer more directly and not beat around the bush. And it was just a missed opportunity. Uh, I'm not going to go at that level uh, in attacking. But Joe and I have, you know, that's for people to decide. All I can say is Joe and I have very significant political differences. And I'm not going to be making, you know, personal attacks on Joe. That's not what I do. That is incredibly heartwarming. And I'm sure that the Democratic Party establishment uh, really admires this respectable stance that he's taking. But this is exactly how you lose an election. Exactly how you lose an election. You can't not point this out. It's irresponsible to not talk about this. And Bernie, over the next couple of days, is going to have to make a decision. His team members are going to have to make a decision. Are we going to be serious going forward? And are we going to stop worrying about what the media and Democratic Party establishment says? And are we going to play to win? Or are we going to try to play fairly and nicely with Democrats in hopes that they don't attack him? Time's ticking. Time is ticking, and this is the most important election of our lives. Like, we always hear that, but this really is. We have less than 12 years to act on climate change, and if Biden's the nominee, Trump gets four more years. And Bernie's the only person who is uh, qualified to run for president, uh, who wants to run for president, really. Like, the only other, who, who else is left after Bernie? Like, who else? AOC's not old enough to run for president. We don't know if she wants it. We don't know if Rashida Tlaib wants it. We don't know if Nina Turner wants it. Elizabeth Warren's not going to cut it. She showed that she doesn't know how to run a campaign because she surrounds herself with Hillary and Kamala people. And she doesn't have the political instincts to win. So Bernie's the only one that we got right now. So this is serious. Stop playing nice with Joe Biden or you're going to lose. And I don't want you to lose. We really, really, really need you to win. The planet depends on you winning. But if you keep this up, it's going to be very difficult for you to win. Joe Biden is a very bad person. Stop treating him with kid gloves. You have to stop this, Bernie. He's a horrible person who had a lot of policies passed that have fucked people over. Stop being nice to him. He doesn't grant you that same courtesy, so don't do it to him. Now, moving on, getting back on track to where Bernie Sanders was having a good night, he talked about why Donald Trump is rightfully afraid to run against him you know, with, when it comes to him versus Biden. And um, the point is something that I think people need to hear. Uh, he has some very smart political consultants around him. And a couple of weeks ago, political consultant, somebody asked him, well, who would you rather run against, Sanders or Trump or whatever? And what the guy said, I forgot his name, he said, you know what? Running against a movement makes me nervous because they understand that our campaign is more than just the campaign. We are creating a multiracial, multi-generational political movement of young people, of working people, of people who believe in justice all across this country. And in his heart of hearts, I think that is what makes Trump very right, nervous. Let, let's talk about the economy. So there you have it. Trump doesn't want to run against a movement. 
because a movement is what Obama had, and Obama won. No, that movement kind of fell apart when he was in office, but he still managed to hold it together long enough to get reelected. So, you know, if the Democratic Party was serious about wanting to beat Donald Trump, then anyone who claims to care about progressive policies would rally around Bernie Sanders right now. Not tomorrow, not Thursday, not next week, but right now. And anyone who is not rallying around Bernie Sanders right now cannot with a straight face, look voters in the eye and say, I care about progressive policies. Because if you did, then you would be backing the person, the only person who stands a chance against Donald Trump in November. Because if you just sit idly by and not speak out for Bernie Sanders while Joe Biden coasts to the nomination and then flames out in the general, you have yourself to blame. You can't blame voters for this. You have to blame yourself if you have any sort of power or influence currently in D.C. So overall, uh, I really would encourage you to watch the full town hall. I think that it was great. I think that Bernie did his best. Um, once again, he always you know, turns on the charm when he's at Fox News. But I want him to keep the same energy when he talks to CNN. I want him to keep the same level of energy when he talks to MSNBC. Because he kind of has it in his head that CNN and MSNBC are better than Fox News, but in actuality, these are all private companies. They're corporations who, they just want to make money. They don't care about the delivery of news. And while one might be the propaganda arm of the Republican Party, the other is the propaganda arm of the Democratic Party. And the ultimate goal of the Democratic Party is to serve the interests of their corporate donors. So Bernie needs to understand that he has no allies in D.C., it's him and his movement, and that's it. Nobody else is going to fight for us. Nobody else is going to have his back. So he's got to make sure that he is more cognizant of the realities of the political situation. And I think he knows this, right? I, I think that he doesn't want to be seen as someone who's too divisive. But, you know, just, just keep the same energy on MSNBC and CNN, and I think you'll be doing better because there's a lot of distrust with the mainstream corporate media because... They're not news. It's just, it's entertainment, right? It's infotainment at best. So you can't you can't only bring this level of you know snark and energy to Fox News town halls. You've got to keep it when you're talking to Jake Tapper on CNN, who will have the same types of corporate talking points. You've got to have it when you're talking to MSNBC, who also is looking to stop your movement and stop all the momentum that we've built up for Medicare for all. So great town hall overall. I just really hope that Bernie Sanders takes all of the criticism that he's receiving from individuals and indie media to heart and acknowledges that if he is going to win this, he's not going to do it by being nice. He's got to be aggressive. He may not necessarily feel comfortable really attacking Joe Biden hard, but that's the only way that you're going to win this because playing nice hasn't worked and you're not going to win over the establishment. So the best that you can do is expose them for the frauds that they are. Mike is a total loser, so don't hit the subscribe button, okay? And whatever you do, folks, do not hit the notification bell either. Mike treats me so unfairly.